The Technology Innovation Conference 2018, held at Gallagher Estate on the 1st and 2nd of February, attracted more than a 1,000 ICT experts and decision-makers from across the public and private sectors. On the second day of the conference, the panel discussion on the topic Managing Digital Threats and Cybersecurity was moderated by Dr. Jabum Tsweni, Research Group Leader for Cyber Defense at the CSIR. My name is uh, Jabum Tsweni. I am from the CSIR, Council of Scientific uh, Industrial Research in Pretoria. I'm the Research Group Leader for Cyber Defense. And uh, in my team here at the MSc for Community Safety and Gauteng, uh, Mrs. Agelen Kosi Malobane, uh, Jim Green is from Gold and Links, uh, one of the gurus as well in the technology space. Uh, Guy Gulan from uh, Performanta is the chief executive officer. And next to him, we've got Vikas, Vikas Kapoor, uh, the head of cybersecurity and uh, governance uh, at Into IT. Professor Bruce Watson uh, is the chairman and the full professor, you know, not a half professor like myself. Uh, at the Information Science School in, uh, at the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, and then the last one is Craig, Craig um, Rosewan. Uh, Craig is the MD of Wolfpack uh, Information Risk. I think uh, they are well known and they've done quite a lot uh, in government as well in business. So let's give them a big round of applause. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. I, I don't know how many of you uh, were following the events last week at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, cybersecurity risks or cybersecurity bridges, they are the second uh, most high risk that has been identified by the world leaders. You know, second to environmental issues like water crisis, climate changes. So it actually tells us that cybersecurity as a domain uh, is, is one of the most important ones, and uh, uh, some, sometimes we only think about it after the effect, after we've been breached. It's like someone who builds the house and only thinks about putting the security alarm afterwards. And today we will be trying to deal with a lot of issues to, to promote cybersecurity, but as well to, 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 to engage on how is cybersecurity relevant to the technology innovation space, how does cybersecurity cyber security contribute you know, to the safety and security of the citizens, the systems, and so on and so forth? And as I start, I would start with um, the MEC, uh, as a, uh, someone who's representing us from government, to just give us an overview on her thoughts with regards to cybersecurity, uh, you know, status or culture in South Africa, Particularly in your case, you are in the safety, you know, you are enforcing these things. Well, what, what are your thoughts? How do you see cybersecurity issues in South Africa? Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very much. Um, just um, as a, an opening remark, um, we had a discussion earlier myself where I made a comment earlier that it's interesting in such an important um, a, a event one of the people that are expected to enforce uh, the laws or to make sure that whatever that is discussed here and the decisions are taken is actually law enforcement agencies and um, none of those were, were actually invited to such an important um, event. And of course, maybe people will say, because the MEC is here, I'm not an operative. So we are also supposed to make sure that we take them on board so that mamas understand or understand where some of the discussions or decisions taken come, come from. Just to respond to your question, um, South Africa is ranked at 58th um, in the ITU Cyber um, Security Global Ranking. And of course, that is a global uh, uh, perspective, but locally we still have a long way to go in establishing cybersecurity culture and preparing the country to understand the importance and implementation of cyber security behavior at home, work, as well as in, 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 in the public. And it's because digital technology has become an important uh, part of our daily lives and um, it will become even more central in our lives as we adapt and enter the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Our lives has become digital as this, um, in cyber, um, this cyberspace is dominating our lives and this is evident with social media, entertainment systems, transportation systems like, such as Uber, online shopping, 
many personal services such as internet banking, a business, or a business operation, and even searching for a soulmate. Uh, you know, you prepare Oxella over <laughs> online. We now have our uh, real life and parallel um, um, uh, and a parallel cyber life. As we move um, with this development into the fourth industrial revolution, the associated risk of security is becoming a, a challenge. Uh, cyber crime and crime committed uh, using digital technology are becoming the most challenging crimes at all law enforcement agencies in, in the world. The most challenging uh, aspect of this situation is that cyber crime and cyber security are two sides of the same, same coin. The most advanced technologies, um, technology skills can be used to commit and of course to prevent uh, crime. Our duty as society is to make sure that those with these skills are on the good side of life, i.e. they are in the cyber security side of life. Thanks. As the MEC was, was, was speaking, Jim, you know, talking about technologies that can be used to commit the crime, but also uh, to do the good things. In, in, in your assessment, again, on staying on the same question about the state of cybersecurity in the country, uh, from the technology point of view, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Chair. Um, this is quite an interesting topic, this one, because um, it's a very wide-ranging answer to actually try and deal with this question. I think um, from a technology perspective, there are quite a number of technologies available to create defenses and do various things. But when we look at the adoption of technology and we actually place it into our economic context, we find that the big corporates have enough money to put the necessary stuff in place and they can deal with that, but when we suddenly find that a major participant in our economy is the small medium enterprise who can't even afford a next generation firewall or something, we have, a, we have this disparate um, coverage and prevention of crime. And so what happens is many of the smaller companies who don't have the, the wherewithal to actually put the necessary practices uh, in place to, to deal with cybersecurity, they actually become the most vulnerable. Um, I, I had a recent event uh, just earlier this week, I had to go to a, another country, one of our neighboring countries, for a, for a small business that operates in the finance area. And they had had their user account hacked. And basically what happened is uh, once this person's identity and what their role was in approving payments was discovered by the attackers, they had a number of authorizations that went out to various banks that they work with to authorize payments, and they lost several million as a result. So I came to sit with them, and the first thing I said, well, I said, what's driving this interaction that, are, that, that we need to have to talk about the cyber crime event? And they said, no, well, the board has had a panic, and now they want penetration tests, they want vulnerability assessments, they want to know what technology they must buy, and all of this type of thing. And I sort of said, well, let's maybe look at what you've got first of all. And I sat down with the, with the, the head of IT, and he said, to be honest with you, I'm very frustrated. So I said, well, what was the problem? He says, I've had requests with my board for five years, and my IT security that I wanted to put in place was never considered topmost in the decision-making of the board. And now, of course, the horse is out of the barn, and now we must do something about it. So we spent a little bit of time looking at it, and, and I think maybe as a general word on, on cybersecurity here, the first thing which you, you mustn't do is panic. Now, when you talk to cyber vendors, and we're all in the cyber space here, so we're probably guilty of this, we have a tendency to market everything about we're vulnerable, this could happen, that could happen, the other could happen, but there needs to be some pragmatic view which is taken to board level that says, how much should I spend? What am I covering? What is the real risk? And hand in hand with that, which is a big issue, which I find with many companies that we engage with, is there's a tendency to think that cyber security is purely an IT issue. And we're finding that, you know, you, you can put the best burglar alarm in your house, but if you don't tell the occupants of the house to lock the door and arm the system before they leave, your technology doesn't help you. So there's very much a people and process issue as well. So I think really just in a nutshell, we need to look at cybersecurity holistically. It's not just a technology issue. It must involve the people of the organization. And in terms of making a decision for what you need to do in cybersecurity, you need to be saying, well, what are the most important things that I need to protect? And what am I doing around that? And you need to rank that because 
at the end of the day, cybersecurity is also a journey, a journey. It's not just an event. So maybe just as a kind of overview to set the scene in terms of cybercrime, we've got to be laying a lot of foundations in our businesses. We can't just take the attitude, if I've bought antivirus and I've got a firewall, that I'm secure. Because the weakest link in any system at the end of the day is people. When it comes to the issue of, of, of smart cities, because ultimately here we are talking about managing these many threats, uh, and, and nowadays they call them uh, modernized city regions, uh, and, and we have a lot of experience in smart cities, you know, making sure that p the citizens themselves are protected, the systems that are being used in the cities are protected. In your assessment, what are some of the cybersecurity issues in this uh, environment, particularly smart cities? Well, thank you. Um, I want to say one thing before that, as, as Madam MEC mentioned uh, regarding participation, participation, particip participation. The, the big issue I've got, my name is Guy, by the way, but the big issue I've got right now is the fact that cybersecurity, according to the World Economic Forum, touches everybody's lives. And the forum right now is quite minimal that we are talking to. And it means that the awareness is not yet there to understand the importance of what's happening in the cyber world that affects everybody person that sits in on chairs here and what are their issues right now, which ties me very strongly into the world of uh, smart cities. So we've done uh, many projects around smart cities. One of, of the flagships uh, that we've done was the TFL, Transport for London, which is the underground system of London, uh, the bus system of London, um, and also uh, the, the overground uh, railway stations for, uh, and traffic for London. The big challenge that exists is that, and we see it in the past five years, while we all want to have things working for us, because we want to serve our audience better, whether they are citizens or small businesses or micro enterprises or government institutions or departments, it all, it's all connected to one another, we used to leave security behind. And the further you leave it behind, the more problematic it becomes. The alignment of business requirements with security has to almost be perfect. As an example, uh, Transport for London, and who've ever been to London knows the Oyster Card. Um, the Oyster Card is a brilliant example of a person using transport with a card that they charge with money. That was the second step. The first one was those tickets that you buy, but that's nothing in terms of smart city. It was a card that you use, and that card allows you to go on on the underground, on buses, and the interesting thing is that if you look at the back end of that, it connects not through a center point to another back office, it connects directly to the data centers of London, of TFL. Now that's a big task. How do you take a card like that and connect it, which I am the user, and connect it all the way back to the data center? It became even more risky when TFL decided to release an application that replaces that card. Because now I've got it on my phone, I can go through any of the gateways that exist when I want to travel, but I can also go, if I am the bad guy, I can go very easily all the way to the back side of TFL and abuse it in each and every way I want. The challenge around that starts when the application is developed and there's no security aligned with it, it's very difficult to play catch up. It's very easy to do it when the alignment happens in place. So from my perspective, I'm seeing, um, and, and I wanted to give that comment because one of, uh, of the instructions we had as panelists is we want to engage with the crowd here. And we want to um, give and li leave with some ideas around that. Come to a point and say to yourself, how do you take a citizen um, from Gauteng that is um, wearing different Colors, um, uh, sex, education, age, and we try to give them whatever we can without having the ability to compromise our systems because enablement is what we are looking at. And security, by the way, enablement is also part of it because in the old ways of security, if something went wrong, you pull the plug. Today, you have to keep the plugs on. So that's one of the things that, that are crucial for me. So from smart cities perspective, I gave just example of TFL, but we've done it with ministries of education in Australia as well. It goes as a silver lining across all the points of how you take the citizen and the user and go all the way 
to those systems without compromising them. And there are many ways on, on doing that, uh, but it starts with identifying what are the risks uh, and where it starts. Last point, sorry, with the permission is, we are all cybersecurity companies. There's a big transformation that is required from us to think like hackers and bad, bad guys. If we just think like cybersecurity people, we might lose quite a lot because they've got bigger labs, better funding, and for those that do not know, 2017 was a tipping point in the history of cybercrime because the revenue to the bad guys from cybercrime um, outnumbered the revenue from human trafficking and drug trafficking put together. So now cybercrime is the largest thing. Wow, thank you, Guy. So you, you are suggesting we must not think like the criminals. And or we should think like criminals. Only thinking. I don't say do yeah, No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. Just we think. must just think like criminals. Uh, but going to, to Vikas and uh, uh, giving you an opportunity, I know you are very passionate about the issue of skills because that's another important aspect that is there. Uh, I don't know how long you've you been in the country, but in your, in your view, talking about cybersecurity now, status in the country, uh, what, what are your thoughts, uh, focusing maybe on, 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 on the skills part? Sure, thanks. Uh, so I work for a South African company called uh, Into ID Technologies. We've been around six years. Uh, personally, for me, it's been uh, a very short journey for about one and a half years. Uh, but my background is that uh, you know, I've traveled globally, 18, 20 different countries, done consulting engagements. So there's a benchmark uh, that I think we could look at. But I think to look at what is the state of cybersecurity uh, in South Africa and the associated uh, skills related to that, I would like to touch upon uh, which the Honorable uh, MEC for, um, uh, for the Houting Department of Community Safety said. So there was a, there's, a, there's a group called uh, International Telecommunications Union, which has about 192 member states, uh, basically countries, Every almost two years, uh, they conduct a survey in terms of where the countries stand as a cybersecurity index. And I think the Honorable MEC said in her opening statement, uh, the rank for South Africa uh, to emphasize is 58 out of 192. If I refer this to a statement uh, which uh, Premier uh, David Makura said yesterday, you know, he said, uh, it's important that Africa is not left behind. It's important that South Africa leads, and it's very important that Houting as a province uh, leads the whole pack. Now, unfortunately, when you look at uh, what the desire is versus what the reality is, pretty different, right? I mean, 58 is not a great rank, and uh, within Africa, uh, South Africa is sixth. So I think Mauritius, Rwanda, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda have a better score in terms of the cybersecurity index. So which means there's definitely, uh, definitely room for doing more. Now when we try to break this down and uh, look at one of the aspects, uh, which is the cybersecurity skills, uh, just to give you a context uh, globally, you know, there, there's a shortage of about uh, roughly 1.2 million cybersecurity professionals by 2020. I was just around the corner. So cybersecurity skills is not just a South Africa problem. Right? It's, it's a global problem. Uh, but coming from my experience in the last uh, year and a half, I think, uh, with all due respect, I think the, the problem is a little more severe in South Africa. And I think there are a couple of reasons, right? I mean, one, when you look at the overall uh, education system, right? I think uh, while I'm sure there's a lot of focus on uh, different aspects of, uh, you know, vocational skills or, you know, skills that will professionally help, I think there's relatively less uh, on, on cybersecurity and probably, you know, the uh, probably Bruce can help uh, later talk a little bit more on in terms of how is it in the universities. But the reason for uh, this gap is also that you know, the, the time that it takes to become a security professional 
is actually a little longer than some of the other, let's say, Java skills. Right? So if you see there is a gap because of different reasons. I mean, in South Africa, if you try to hire a security professional, it easily takes three to six months for one position to close. Right? So basically, yes, there is cybersecurity skills gap. So then the next follow questions that comes is, what is it that we can do about it? Right? And I think and that becomes, I think, some of the key takeaways uh, from our session where we could, from representing you know, the industry, uh, we, we could go back and say, look, I think there are a couple of things we can do. One, I think there's tremendous room of uh, opportunity to you know, have a lot more of uh, cybersecurity programs, trainings, centers, and things like that. Yesterday, I was listening to Honorable Minister for Science and Technology, and, and I think what was mentioned that there's a lot of investment which is done in R&D. But I think uh, we did not hear the, any investment in R&D in cybersecurity. So that's an opportunity area. Uh, and then I think a lot of industry participation, uh, which was discussed, uh, I think, today, uh, is also an opportunity area to fill the skills gap. I want to give the professor, Bruce, uh, you work quite a lot with the students. You know, you do quite a lot of innovation. And I think, after all, this conference is about technology innovation. So what is your take? Cybersecurity status in the country and innovation? Can you say something ar around that? Uh, I, in I indeed can. Thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to drill down to some of the issues underlying that. Um, in fact, I'd like to echo some of the things that uh, some of my, my uh, predecessors here have actually had to say about this this morning. Um, on the university front, there's also actually a, a subtle difference between what Vikas, for example, has just been talking about, and that is actually the need to up our, uh, our skill set within the country in terms of cybersecurity professionals, cybersecurity um, uh, practitioners in every company, and also, of course, in government. But there's another thing that I'd also like to briefly mention before I come back to the previous one, and that is the, um, the much broader need to actually instill a, a culture of cybersecurity awareness. And this was uh, also mentioned right at the beginning, actually, by the, uh, the Honorable MEC. So what I mean by that is within the university, you know, my department, for example, and many other departments uh, in all provinces, cover cybersecurity uh, in varying degrees for all students, so not just for students that are coming there to study something related to cybersecurity, but we're interested in instilling a, a culture of being cybersecure yourself. And uh, it, it goes hand in hand, of course, with the notion of privacy, which is something that we should all, all care about, especially as we move towards a, a proper digital identity. So we should care about these kinds of things. But the, um, what our observation at the university level is that people are actually arriving um, at the point where we can help them and, and bring across this, uh, this culture much too late. So this is actually something that, to be very honest, needs to be pushed down into high schools, in addition to us doing, doing that at the university level, but pushed down into high schools, further down into primary schools as well. It's, it's far too late if people arrive in first year and then for postgraduate uh, degrees and then start thinking about these, uh, these issues and how they themselves interact with their own uh, environment as well. So we see something similar if you look at, uh, at the real world, so not the cyber world in other words. Um, you wouldn't really recommend to people that they, that they deal with their personal safety by taking one course in, in judo or karate or jiu-jitsu or something like that. You also wouldn't just say, well, your personal safety is just about having a, a panic button or, uh, or something along those lines. You actually grow up with a notion of what your personal safety is about and how to interact with your environment. And that's not to encourage any form of paranoia, but um, it, it really can start a, at a much earlier age, and I'd like to strongly encourage that. Um, so that covers, uh, let's say, the, the largest uh, group of people that we'd like to have uh, this instilled with. Uh, and then, of course, that brings us back to, uh, to what Vikas and, in fact, some other people also mentioned, and this is the need for a, an actual skill set uh, within the country of professionals that are dealing with cybersecurity. So that, again, is something that I, I very strongly support. Um, 
you know, the amount of funding that's available for this is not zero, fortunately, um, but on the other side of the coin, it could be more. And what we see is a number of the, the highly digital societies uh, like Singapore and Estonia are actually spending uh, significantly more and, and are able to spend significantly more uh, on this kind of thing. But uh, we, it would be well worth our while, especially if we start thinking about the, the amounts of money lost, as, as Guy said, um, to really spend a bit more on that kind of research. Um, the other thing is uh, related to the research, we have a tremendous amount of homegrown research within the country, um, ranging from tools to expertise. That's, of course, what my fellow panelists are here uh, talking about today. Um, but many of these things are, are largely invisible. You know, we, we do things within the university uh, environment and then, of course, filter out into industry. We interact and, and learn from industry. Uh, but perhaps more awareness and publicization of that would, uh, would serve us very well. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, our audience, you are participating. Uh, I can see uh, you, you, you are addressing some issues on how, for example, we can deal with cybersecurity skills shortage. Many of you believe that we must start early, you know, at school. Uh, I don't think there's any university that offers a full-blown cyber qualification from start to finish. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll come back to you now, Guy, before I get to, 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 to Craig. But I've also seen some of the, um, the, the questions when it speaks about the issue of awareness, and I think they've raised that. Some of you don't know that you have been a victim of crime. Uh, my assertion is that all of us in here have been victims of cybercrime, uh, including the MEC. Uh, Guy, before I come to you, I just want to give Craig uh, an opportunity just to, to end off this first round. Uh, he he is very strong in working with both government and the public sector. So now, Craig, my question to you is, of course, talking about the state of the cybersecurity in the country. When you look at the public and the private sector, are they miles apart, or they are more or less the same? The state now, generally speaking. Good question. Um, I think maybe just to set the scene, I think there's, what I like to always try and do is to break it up into three areas. Because number one, people underestimate the complexity of what cyber, the opportunities that cyber brings from a business disruption, from a government disruption, um, but also the risk side of things. And then the other issue is the issue of leadership. So these two points around complexity and leadership follow through across these three areas. Number one, when you look at our national needs, and I'll unpack that in a few, in a few lines, when we unpack it from a industry, from a corporation needs, and then right down to our individual levels, us as human beings, us as parents, as family members. Those issues of complexity and leadership are issues. So, you know, from a national point of view, Jabba, what I would say is, we, as a country, are very good at bringing out the right policies. We're very diligent and studious when it comes to paperwork. The challenge is in the next phase around implementation. And that's a real problem that we've got in this country. You've heard on the skills side, you've seen on you know, the rollout of national certs in the country or in Africa. South Africa has fallen behind. And even in our interaction as government with other governments in Africa, for example, you may have read about, you know, with the AU, uh, the donation of a lovely building and technology by a certain country's government for African AU countries, you know, that, that was compromised. There's, there was back doors in there and very sensitive political information has been siphoned off into the hands of a certain country, which I'm sure you can guess it is, with strong financial motives for, for winning deals in, uh, on the continent. A critical infrastructure, for example, which is owned by both government and private sector. So there's a number of key challenge areas in the government space that we seriously need to look at, our national key points, for example, as well. And then the other issue around understanding the opportunities and complexity and leadership from an industry point of view. You know, when we talk to companies, you talk at a board level, at an exco level, um, there's an understanding, there's a bit of an awareness, but there's not an understanding of what needs to be done. Um, slowly, Senior management is understanding what the benefits and the, uh, the risks are. And it's unfortunately, as we mentioned earlier, it's once the poor pause at the fan, that serious consideration and priority is given to the issue. 
And then the last one, which is often overlooked, is the whole issue of us as human beings in our personal lives. We do a lot of awareness. We do a lot of awareness at schools. A lot of very sad stories and cases coming out with our children, with people that are, you know, small businesses, schools, getting taken for large amounts of money and not having any recourse. Number one, there's no awareness for these guys. It's another failing for us in the community around raising awareness to try and prevent these things from happening, but also there's no recourse when they fall victim. I'm sure some of you have got friends or family that have gone to go and try and report it at the police station and try and get it investigated. The criminals just get away with it, and they just become more and more brazen. So there's a whole lot of challenges that we need to take ownership of and uh, see how we're going to deal. You are from India. You work a lot with uh, different countries. And when you speak about trust, and I'm sure many of the audiences here, they know that in South Africa, for example, technologies that we use, they are mostly from overseas countries. How does trust come into play? Because, you know, when you go to government, I think many people would know, uh, they will say, you know what, we can't buy technology solution from country A because we don't know if there's a back door there, it's a trust issue again. Uh, how, how do we deal with this in, a, in this global economy? Because we are not an ice, a, a, a sort of an island on our own. Sure. So I'll take a step back and uh, uh, look at you know, what trust is and how do we, as humans, establish trust. And I think there are two factors uh, which primarily play a significant role when it comes to trust. Uh, of the other individual, and in this case, the government, for example. I think the first is action, and then second is the time factor. Right? So if you look at humans, you don't trust anyone for a good action on day one. Right? You want the good actions, and you want those good actions to continue, and then say, okay, now I trust the person. Now, you put this in the context of what we are discussing as, and the, what the poll result, uh, quite astonishing, is uh, have there been right actions, and have there been right actions for a continued period of time for the citizens of this country to trust our governments respectfully? So as an example, Protection of Personal Information Popia Act. I think it's been quite a while, and it's still not there. When you compare this to what some of the developed nations are doing, uh, not necessarily as a benchmark, but more uh, as an element of research, uh, European Union has come out with the GDPR which is a general data protection regulation, in which the same personal information, if breached, there are 20 million pounds, or 4% of the revenue of the company that goes as a fine. Right? So I think that trust will come. It's a matter of time, and it's a matter of actions. Specifically talking about uh, the sourcing of uh, technology uh, from, from different uh, parts of the world. Quite frankly, unfortunately, we don't have too much of an option there. Right? I mean, either we build it, or if someone else is building, we take it. Right? But what can be done is, is a bit of a toll gate in between, which is, if these are the technologies that are going to come into my country, do I at least have a bit of an assessment or an analysis or something done? And you referred the country I come from, that's exactly what we do. If you look at one of the, uh, you know, there's Gartner provides a magic quadrant uh, for different technologies globally, right? I mean, if you look at the number of security companies, with all due respect, a lot of them are partners, uh, there are about 230 different security products in 14 to 15 different areas. Right? So there is a wider choice. Right? So you could look at the choice, 
uh, in that context and probably choose what's potentially coming from, I think, broadly three different countries. So there are not many options. So to answer your question in summary, I think it's a, it's a matter of time by, it's a matter of actions and time, uh, you know, by our uh, government. It's a matter of uh, having certain toll gates and, uh, and it's hiring people like us to, you know, filter that through. <laughs> Let's change the gears a bit. And uh, Bruce, from an academic point of view, and I want to uh, go back to the innovation aspect, because we have painted a picture of some of the challenges. I think in the cybersecurity space, there are quite a lot of challenges, but there are also quite a number of solutions. So in your view, what does the future, and now I want to be a Sangoma, uh, look like with regards to the emerging and future technologies that could, you know, especially from the innovation point of view, that could help us to address some of these challenges, particularly uh, the issues of trust, the issues of awareness, the issues of uh, sharing of information, you name it. Do you think there's some innovation opportunities in this space of cybersecurity? Well, I think I could probably talk for, uh, for quite a while about potential innovation in this space because I think there's no shortage of, uh, of clever people, uh, not only internationally, but also nationally, and, and as I said, at, at many institutions, also research groups within companies and, and consultancies. So I think that's, uh, that's very promising. Um, if I had to choose a couple of things that I think are, are maybe um, very promising, but maybe not in the immediate future, but in the, the slightly more distant future, um, I would then like to do a bit of maybe blue sky thinking and say that if we take a look at trust and identity, you know, there are, are many people thinking uh, about the immediate solutions to this, but we could also be more radical and uh, take a look at how things like trust emerge in, in social uh, media or social networks. So this is not something that, uh, that fits our traditional model of trust, where there's uh, often transacting and, and uh, direct rating of, of individuals. But if you look at social networks, social media, people tend to have uh, built up trust relationships that are, are implicitly embedded there. And of course, all of the, the social media leaders know this, and this is actually what they mind to, to figure out what to push onto your, uh, your news stream or your recommendations and, and so on. But that's maybe something that we could actually mine a bit more closely for, um, for the running of e-government and smart cities and our, our general interactions. I see that as being one of the, the very promising directions. Uh, another one that's maybe also a radical idea would be, um, and I put this up as a, as a question, I didn't even anonymize it, but you know, I wonder to myself if we don't need uh, some more citizen-based uh, policing. And I don't mean uh, that we need uh, censorship or we need vigilantism or, or things along those lines, but uh, many of, of our, our panelists today have pointed out that it's, uh, number one, is it's easier to be bad than to be good. So the, we, we can be outgunned very quickly by, by cyber uh, bad guys. And uh, once we've reached a certain level of cybersecurity awareness, it, it's not unthinkable to say people have a, a moral obligation to report what they see. In the same way that if you see someone, um, you know, breaking into a car, you you could of course walk by, but you you should probably report it. So there's this, as I said in the first round, uh, a notion of of awareness and uh, instilling the culture, and this can then be extended, as I said, to cyber policing. Now um, this connects back to one of the uh, the polls and a couple of the other questions that I see there. So many people, I think, in the audience are thinking about this as well. Um, it's also you know, reaching the point where our own court system, our own policing will need huge amounts of money to really keep up with this. And I think we need to then think even further out of the box where a certain amount of the investigation um, is either privatized or is, is, uh, is mined from, uh, from the masses, shall we say. And uh, again, that requires a certain number of people that then are aware of what looks like a cyber crime and, and are able to, to report this. And it may be that it's, it's private individuals that do the, the mining of, of some nugget that's then used for prosecution uh, or to push back on, on cyber crimes. I want to go back to the issue of innovation. So in your view, cybersecurity, especially in many organizations, in government, even in us as citizens, as I've mentioned earlier in my introductory comments, is, a, is an afterthought. We only react afterwards. So in the innovation chain, 
or life cycle. How significant is cybersecurity? And in your view, where do you think it must start? I know. I'll be, I'll be quick on that, and I'm going to start with the phone that is here. So this is a Samsung phone. How many of us buy an Apple or Samsung phone and know the full functionality of what we've got in our hand, or we just use it for what we've been using it for probably the last five years? Ask yourself the question. That's, the role, that's not the role of innovation, but that's how they sell innovation to us. They tell us about facial recognition. Anyone, how many use facial recognition on their phone by a raise of hand? Ah, but you still buy it because they say they've got those functionalities. So from my perspective, the role of innovation is magnificent. It's brilliant. It's enabling if you take it in the right direction. As, and, and I'm going to go with, a, a, and the fellow panelists mentioned a few um, classes that exist. So I'm going to go with government, I'm going to go with departments, I'll go with business or enterprise, micro business, and then people, and within people I'll go families. Every one of us has a big role in adoption of innovation, and always innovation worked well when it enabled us. It didn't work when it didn't, and it, you vote by, by your feet, or by your fingers in, in today's terms. So from my perspective, if we ask ourselves where us as people adopt innovation properly and how we secure, go with the following question. Awareness at school. Awa that's, that's kids. Then go to family and let's understand how parents, because we literally deposit, sorry about my word, we deposit our children at school. We deposit them at 8 o'clock, we don't get any interest, and at 5 o'clock or 4 o'clock we get them back. It's a deposit. It, it, literally, we deposit them. What do we do with that? Where do we do at school that happens that we as parents understand what is our responsibility? In terms of security, I'm not talking about further than that. So, cyberbullying. The ability of a child to look at a screen and not knowing us as parents that this child is in such a stress that will cause that child maybe to think about ending his or her life. Second point is organizations. Micro organizations, and for example, London has one million, one million micro companies, businesses, shawarma, um, uh, dry cleaning, and so on. What's the importance for them? They need to realize that. And at the moment, they don't realize it from our experience through the business. They understand it from the family. Then you go into enterprise, and that's where we have, we have a double-edged sword. It's regulation, because regulation that is created forces us to do something about it. But we do the bare minimum, not the maximum or the most efficient thing to do. And that's our challenge, because we follow the bare minimum and say, we are secure, but we're not safe. And then it comes to government. And as government, we have to wear the emotional level, emotional intelligence to say, how do I do the best I can to serve, because the word is to, in police, to protect and serve. In others, is to serve. To protect and serve my people that are using it, whether they drive the streets of Johannesburg, or whether they use my water, or whether they consume any other of the services, what role do I do? And it's not because I tick the box, it's because I feel what's right and what's wrong. That's when security is becoming realistic, and not just another beautiful one and a half hour panel that will make some of the vendors more money. Jim, I want to touch back to what Guy was saying, but from a different perspective now. You know, I'm looking at the poll there. Many people say they don't know the features. Oh, you don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to ask you that question. But many people say they don't know the functionalities that are on their phones and so on and so forth. But let's talk about now the issue of, uh, I think Craig in the beginning spoke about the issue of alignment, you know, aligning business, of course, needs and security needs. One of the critical thing that appears now and again on why people, for example, are not thinking cybersecurity or they, are not, they don't have the culture of cybersecurity is the issue of usability or uh, what do you call, want to call it, um, the issue of user experience and the security. You know, it's like if a password is 16 characters, someone might not use this, might not remember it. So in now these 
cybersecurity challenges and as he was speaking now uh, with regards to the innovation chain. In your view, how important is balancing user experience or usability and security? Well, I think that's the age-old conundrum of security. I think, the, uh, I think everybody realizes that uh, the more security you have, the more difficult it is to use the service that you want to access because you, in a sense, raising barriers to make sure that only the properly authorized person can actually get hold of the service. But the more secure you want to make it, the more processes you introduce. So we talk, you know, talk multi-factor authentication. Most people with banking apps, for instance, now also need to have a cell phone so they can receive a message and get a one-time password or whatever. But what you've done is you've made the, the process of accessing the service more complicated. And the ultimate secure system is one that nobody can use. <laughs> That's the one extreme. The totally insecure system is the other one that you get everything that you want, you can do what you like, but we can't guarantee any security whatsoever. And I think the security architect's challenge is where do you draw the line between ease of access and use that people will actually use it, but you don't go so far to the point that they say, this is such a hassle, I can't actually use it anymore. But at the same time, what you're wanting to do is you look at the, the value of what you're offering or the information that you're gathering from that service, and you have to say, well, I need some minimum things in place. So I think we're always going to be trying to find that compromise between use and security. It's really a big challenge. It, it's one of the biggest challenges. If you can ask the audience, how many of them have just a password on their cell phone, or how long or how often do you change your social media password? I'm not talking about the one at work where you are forced to change it. Just the social media one. Many of you probably you take the whole year forever not changing it. You spoke about Yahoo, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, let me see. I saw a question here. I want to ask you, and then I will ask one question to, to everybody as we close. Let me see. You know, there was a question here which they were asking about can the South African police, I know you are not in the police, but you might have JMPD, that might be your role. Are they ready, are they capable of dealing with cybercrime issues? Um, I actually, maybe my opening remarks did, did indicate, uh, you've got my answer, because I indicated that um, among the South African police or uh, among the um, South African law enforcement agencies, uh, knowledge is uh, is limited, um, and that's why every time a cyber crime is committed, there is a lot of question, and they don't even know how to to handle it. Except those that specialises in that particular area, we've got very few people within the service that specialises in cyber in cyber crime. But as Houting. Um, we were approached by a gentleman called Mr. Shab, uh, uh, Mr. Kumalo, who then said, I will educate your, your police uh, on how to deal with cyber crime. And there was a roadshow to, uh, to all 142 police stations. But you must know that people are not that much interested uh, in, it's not an attractive subject for them what they are used to and the kind of training that they've received at, at college is the scope and donor approach. Um, <laughs> uh, and if there is no scope and donor involved, people are not excited. Uh, that's the nature of their business. And I think what you are now going to do is to try and educate them, at, start the education at the, at the college level. Right? By the time they leave college, they've been trained on how to deal with cyber a cyber crime, but currently we are uh, um, challenged uh, in terms of getting proper service or a proper response from 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 the police uh, when cyber crime is committed. Thanks. Uh, you, you may you may maybe just to put something extra on that on that topic. Uh, I spent a number of years consulting to the police in in this area, and I think one of the challenges that the police experiences as they are starting to grow skills and they're starting to prepare cases, then they suddenly find with the National Prosecuting Authority we don't have prosecutors who know how to present the evidence. And then we go further down the criminal justice value chain and now we're in the court and we have the presiding officer and the presiding officer doesn't know how to weigh the evidence that's being presented. 
So I think from a criminal justice response perspective, we need to be looking beyond just what the police are doing as well. We need to make sure that the criminal justice system can actually deal with cybercrime. A second guy? The challenge is much bigger than that. Governments and countries are not ready for cybercrime. Um, in, in a situation, one of the big telco here, we caught a fraudulent person, and you have to catch the person when they do it, as they do it, and it was in another country in Europe, and they hacked and stole a lot of money from one of the telcos here. When we grabbed the guy and the Interpol ca caught that guy, they put him, put him for two years in jail because they aligned it with some kind of, of a legislation. But you know what's the feeling, what's the interesting thing? The guy is still hacking because he's allowed to have a computer in jail. Yeah. So just what I want to say, it's much bigger than that. Yeah. I want to start with Craig as we close off, and everyone I want uh, to speak on this item. In my next life, when I'm the president of South Africa, uh, I will make you the minister of cybersecurity because I think we really need, I'm, I'm, Craig, now all of you, I'll make you ministers of cybersecurity. I will reshuffle you every three months. <laughs> so don't worry. So Craig, as, as a first one, we have talked about the issues. We have talked about uh, some of the potential solutions. We have talked about the innovation side. So as the next Minister of Cybersecurity in the country, what will be your cybersecurity program look like to address all of these issues? One minute. Jabu, what you've said and what the MEC spoke about making cybersecurity an attractive subject, I think the solution is six cyber robots that need to be rolled out. <laughs> Let me explain what I'm saying. In today's innovation and technology, they're bringing out robots that feel like humans. There's artificial intelligence. You can talk to them. If you, as a person at home, had to go and spend 50,000 rand on a home security, cyber security system, how many of you would go out and do it? Many people would go out and buy, I'm using the sex robot as a concept. They would go out and spend money on that. Imagine you could spend money on that and it gives you fun and pleasure, but at night when you're sleeping, it's also then walking around and protecting your, your home physically, and it keeps an eye on your cyber security. There, that's where we're taking innovation and coupling it with cyber security, where it's making it more relevant to address people's real needs. That sort of thinking is what we need to do to make it relevant for ministers, so that they attend sessions like us and pay attention, that execs, so that they focus on, on dealing with the, the issues that are relevant to them, and also for our, our families. Thank you. Bruce? So I actually like Craig's answer, so I'm, I'm, I'm voting for him as well. But uh, if I were to add, uh, add something to that, I would say really actually push the whole notion of cybersecurity up and down the entire pipeline, education pipeline, so that we catch people that also don't end up going to university, perhaps, and, and it becomes part of the, uh, the, the instilled culture. Thank you, Bruce. Uh... Thanks. Uh, so I think my opening comment is, is actually a ministry of cybersecurity now in one of the neighboring countries of uh, South Africa. Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. And, uh, but that's a point of debate. I think um, uh, whether it should sit under ICT should be separate. I think that's a totally different uh, ballgame altogether. But thanks for nominating me still. Uh, I think if, if I am uh, assigned as that responsible task uh, for this nation, I think what I would probably want to do is to have a measurable model clearly out in the public, which basically takes our position from, uh, as the Honorable MEC said, from number 58 now to first number one in Africa, and then be at least in the top 10 uh, globally. And in order to do that, uh, I think the model uh, should have five pillars. The first, legal. Second, uh, technical. Third, organizational. Fourth, capacity building. And fifth, cooperation. So I think once you have a measurable model, uh, you could really see that even when I retire from that ministry, you know, still it takes over. Good one. Since you gave me a month, I will have to think about uh, the, the ones that will take the role for me. So. I would, start, I would start with the end in mind, what we want to achieve and where we want to go. And when we go with the end in mind, it will go with long, medium, and short term. But first, and, and it goes holistically, it touches education, it touches the people, it touches the technology and everything in that. But we have to start with the end in mind, where we want to get as a government 
as a local government to try and see where we want to head towards. And I would go with something I call the triple A, which is aware, which is transparency. Then after that, I would go with a level of acceptance, and then I will act on it. So if we fall in, it's a psychological term called the AAA, not the, double, the AA, the AAA. If we start with awareness and transparency, we know our situation, we can measure it, as Vika said, and then we can go and take it further. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I probably want to endorse what everybody said so far, so I won't repeat <laughs> everything it said, but I think maybe just one, call it outlook perspective. I think from a government perspective, one often gets the idea that... Um, we have to use the levers of state power to make things happen. And normally that's expressed through making laws, putting policies in place, and it's very much kind of top down. But I think one of the challenges that we have in society is you can't regulate an attitude. And I think there's some thinking out of the box that we need at a governmental level to say, how do I engage from the purpose of helping and not just from the purpose of controlling? And I think if we can create a climate of collaboration and interaction and support those that have the passion to fix the problem, we'll do better than just trying to employ control and do it ourselves. That really my headline. Thank you. MEC, you are the next minister, by the way, of cybersecurity. So your last thoughts? No, I was in another meeting, I was at seconded, but we need, <laughs> <laughs> we need to move uh, past awareness now. Um, because being aware doesn't necessarily mean that you are educated as an individual to know um, how to respond to, to, to cyber security. I will also involve every structure of society uh, and educate them on cyber, on cyber security, including the gurus, those that think that they know, because they also become a victims of cyber, of cyber crime. And of course, digital, Technology is still complex to, uh, for many of our citizens and older generations. Uh, in fact, even the young generation need to be educated properly uh, on cyber security because many of them uh, live a dangerously cyber, uh, okay, dangerously online life. So with that, I want to thank my esteemed panel, particularly the MEC for gracing us. Uh, spending time with the hackers, uh, the good ones, the white ones, uh, the white hackers. Uh, I want to thank the audience. I think your questions have been great. I, I now I understand what it is like to be on radio. You know, you can't read all the calls and the SMSs, but we thank you for all your inputs. And uh, may you give a big round of applause for the, uh, for, for the panel.